Hi, you're listening to Wimbledon, hosted by me, Nick Ray. Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm doing it Zoom style this time. Uh, so for those of you who've been following on uh, on um, YouTube and watching these videos, you'll notice it's a slightly different format this week because we're going Zoom. Uh, my normal provider has failed us this week's podcast. <laughs> but Zoom should do as well. I think uh, the Zoom fatigue has definitely not set in yet. So this week I have from Austria calling in another former EF superstar. We have <laughs> Nina, and I'm going to completely mash the uh, surname, but you can correct me on it. Baurega. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's, that's great. That's awesome. uh, I'm going to pass over to Nina to give us her surname properly and also to introduce herself a little bit. So, Nina, if you want to just say who you are, where you're from, and what you're doing in the world right now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Nick. I'm super excited about this opportunity. Uh, congratulations. I'm so impressed by the way you pronounced my name. Um, oh, my like, actually, there's so many German speakers uh, that do it wrong because they pronounce it in a very sloppy way. So I'm like, wow. Um, yeah, so I'm Nina. I live in Austria, in Vienna. Um, it's one of five countries that I've lived in, but that's the one that I actually was born and bred. I'm a marketing communications and sales professional. That's, uh, I think, the skill kind of uh, base that describes me best. Um, and I just, uh, I love traveling, I love sports, and I love growing. So I'm super excited about today because it makes me grow so much because this is my first podcast ever. And I'm so excited that this is with Nick, which I have always enjoyed working with. And who actually made me grow in my time at EF. He probably doesn't know, but he did. So, yeah, thank you again for having me. Oh, that's really sweet of you to say. Well, okay, so I'm going to start by throwing you back a compliment. And everyone on the <laughs> other end of this who's listening can just cr cringe. But uh, I, I have to say, Nina is one of the people I've worked with who is um, an amazing ball of energy. And she, she just really lit up. The, the 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 work environment and and had this great energy and in, in ef which is where we were working uh especially in language travel which is where we have young students traveling in groups to go uh on summer summer kind of summer holidays with with english learning or, or language learning along the way um it requires a lot of energy because the the staff are usually uh, temporary in the in the places they're going to so um, it needs people like Nina with that ball of energy to really drive things forward and get the team motivated and she was just fantastic at that and so I've uh, I followed Nina along the way uh, and um, although she's still relatively young she has managed to achieve a heck of a lot and she's now in this um, marketing field which is one of the reasons I was really interested to talk to her is she's a specialist in communication she also has an MBA now uh, but also she's done some really interesting stuff along the way so that is I'm going to frame it a little bit uh, more in depth for you to because you're obviously being humble about it but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but specifically I wanted to kind of uh, uh, talk to you about a couple of things that I, I was particularly impressed with and one of them was this this life ball that that I, I mentioned to you just before we got on on here because that's something that you talked to me about a very long time ago uh, and I wanted you to talk through what the life ball was and why you ended up doing it uh, how how did you get into it why did you end up doing it and you did it for I think 16 years you said so can you talk to me a little bit but maybe frame what it is first for the people yeah, I'm super happy, um, first of all, that you remember it and, and to, to talk about it as well. Lifeball is, um, is an NPO. Uh, it's a fundraiser that raises money for uh, people who are living with and who are infected with AIDS or HIV. Um, and it's a, a fundraiser that is unique. And I know every you know, fundraiser is special, but this one is really unique because the purpose of this fundraiser was not only to raise money, but to do so by celebrating life. It actually started about 20 years ago uh, in a time where, you know, being um, positive was something that was not as normal as it is today. 
it was in a time where uh, people were afraid of people being infected with AIDS and HIV, where they wouldn't touch them, where they wouldn't want to be in the same room with them, where they refused to drink out of the same glass because they felt, okay, we're going to be infected and we all have to die. Back then, um, AIDS was still a death penalty, you know? So um, it, was a, it was a dark time, especially, of course, in the gay scene, but it became more mainstream as an illness. And this is where two people, one of them uh, is Gary, uh, Gary Kessler, the founder, actually wanted to make a statement. And I wanted to, you know, in the middle of all this illness and prejudice and uh, this pain of losing friends, of losing family, of being afraid, uh, he wanted to celebrate life. And he wanted to make a statement of life being precious, even if you're positive. And this is what they did. And he, they did that with a very flamboyant show. Um, so it was super creative. It was, um, it was a show that portrays all like people from all walks of life. So you could see, you know, the super C level manager there, or you know, some shop assistant, and it really didn't matter. People could, you know, come in classical ball gowns or dress up creatively. So they could come in drag, or they could wear their fetish clothes, or whatever. It was very fancy. It was very big. We had up to 40,000 spectators, um, you know, people watching the show. It was a live show and a big ball in, inside of the City Hall Square. And that made it even more special because uh, Vienna actually let this fundraiser happen in the City Hall Square, which is a political building. And back then that was a massive, massive statement, right? So I wasn't part of it from the beginning because I was a little bit too young. But when I left university, I figured I want to be an events manager because that's like the coolest uh, job on earth after being an EF course leader, of course. Um, and then I was like, OK, so I want to do something big and I want to do something that has an impact. And I actually also wanted to do something that uh, helps people. And Lifeball had it all. You know, help people. It had an impact. Um, it was big. It's really huge, right? Um, and this is how I joined it. And uh, I had different positions. I worked as a permanent member of staff, and then I chose a different career path. Um, but I stayed with uh, this MPO as a volunteer for in total 18 years, actually. It wow. took me a little bit longer. Probably after 16 year years, I said, okay, that's it. <laughs> and I did two more. Yeah, so... And uh, it was a big part of my life. Uh, it was a significant part of my life. And uh, I wouldn't want to miss it in the world. So, yeah, that's a good time. I think I, I, it's, it's kind of interesting to me as well. I think one of the reasons I was particularly interested to talk to you as well was you've always struck me. So you had that energy I talked about, but also uh, I could tell you were ambitious. I mean, I, I don't remember when we worked together, I don't remember you being sort of overtly ambitious, like, Nick, what's the next step? How do we move? You know, how do I get this next thing? How do I get this? Next? But it wouldn't surprise me if that was a conversation we'd had because you, you definitely came across with a good, ambitious uh, sort of uh, approach to your work. And I can, and just what you've said just then, you know, about kind of working out, I want to do an event, I want to be an events manager. So I want to make a statement. I want to do this. Okay. That makes sense. So you were being quite calculated in, uh, in your sort of pathway for how do I achieve this? Uh, which fortunately for me ties nicely into the theme of my podcast, which is constructing, <laughs> constructing wins and, and building pathways, I suppose, and, and, and achieving goals. I, I know that you're now a coach as well, but also a, a keynote speaker and you, you've worked, you're working with, with uh, various companies to help them uh, in their, in their communications and things. Do you, do you think you have been quite planned and 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 de sort of determined on a, a, a specific pathway or set of pathways through your career in your life um i would actually say i was passionate mm -hmm. i started off being a mess to be honest i started off being a mess at school because i was super unhappy in school um for several reasons you know um i chose the wrong type of school and then you know I went to commercial school and that was not so usual for girls back then. Um, and then I had teachers who, you know, plainly uh, didn't believe in me and they were kind of um, 
so it ended up giving me a good feeling about my efforts and, you know, that I could achieve anything. And I wasn't quite sure if I could even go to university. And uh, so it was, was a, a struggle. And this is why I fell in love with EF so hard. Because when I went on EF trips as a student, I learned that learning is much more than just grades, right? And that learning in context and learning with fun and for purpose is actually something that makes people grow. So um, in a way, it really helped me to develop kind of this belief that as long as you enjoy something and you're passionate about something, you can achieve something. Um, and this is how I went to university. And then I had this amazing professor and he, you know, he was quite uh, intense, to put it like this. And in my first semester there, he gave me this huge book, Grapes of Wrath, that's about 800 pages. And that was before I had read my first book in English ever, right? And he gave me this book and he was like, yeah, so it's your task to analyze it. And, you know, there's Bible allegories and, and all of that. And I was like, what is he going on about? Like, she, you know, and then I was so insecure and he could read it off my face. You know, it was so obvious. I just wanted to leave and hide. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, trust in your own special self because I do. And then I was like, wow, he's so smart and he's so cool. And like, he's achieved so many things. So if he believes I can do this, then this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do this because I love literature and I love English. And, you know, so like, I will believe in myself and this is what I'm going to do. And you know what? It worked out. Uh, I wrote a really good paper. Um, it was super, super long. I think for him, it probably was super boring, but I was so proud of it. Um, and it was, it was such an achievement. And then I was like, okay, I was afraid to do this, but um, I did it just because I tried and I believed in myself. And I think that was kind of the kickstart to the rest of my career. And I'm not ambitious in the way of, you know, position or salary or, you know, with, what's my next step. I'm ambitious as in the impact that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And I get very intense if I believe in something. So like with EF where we met or with LifePol where I worked for such a long time, I just felt this is, like, let's say EF, that's the best thing that could happen to a student, you know, go and travel abroad at such a young age with people who take care of this person, uh, people that turn windows, you know, walls into windows, um, meet other nationalities, people from all over the world, just have fun and grow. And I believed in that so strongly that this kept me going for years and years and years. And I think this is what made me have a career, you know, in a corporate, uh, in a corporate kind of style. Um, yeah. So I think it's, in my case, my ambition is, is passion. Mm. That's my driver. No, I can see that. And, and I think, uh, so you posted on LinkedIn something the other day, which is one of the reasons it, it triggered me to say, I want to speak, I want to speak to Nina. You, you, you wrote something, even though you haven't worked for the, yeah, for quite a long time now, yeah. uh, you wrote a uh, sort of happy birthday or something. I think it was to Bertel Holt or something. And, you know, saying what an impact that it had on your life. And I think that's something that's seemingly very common amongst a lot of EF people. I mean, EF people generally, we, we, you know, mm. it's, it, there's, <laughs> they get quite close. You work in a pretty intense environment yeah. and, and very closely. And it's, and it's a lot of passion towards what you've just said, you know, educating kids, opening the world through education and things. So, um, yeah, I, I can relate to it, but I can also see that you had that passion. So how have you then applied that passion now? Like, where are you at in, in, in terms of uh, applying your passion and, and what are you chasing down now in life? Um, that's an interesting question. I think especially in the, in the time that we are now, you know, with Corona kind of hitting us all mm -hmm. one way or another, uh, because um, passion, of course, is confined at the moment, right? Because you can be very passionate about traveling or taking kids abroad, but it's not happening so much these days, right? Nope. <laughs> um, so, um, like, what I did is I actually allowed myself a luxury um, because I allowed myself to have a year where I focus on things that I never dare to do in a professional way. So it's not bungee jumping or anything like that because obviously that's not happening so much either. Um 
But I decided that, you know, I can't go on with my regular life, doing sports all the time, going to the theater, ballet. You know, I live in Vienna. What can I say? You know, culture is, is part of uh, everyday's culture. Um, I can't travel. So I decided I'm going to do something that I never dare to do, which is actually build my own business. Um, I've been working as a trainer, as a coach for 15 odd years for individuals, but mainly on a corporate level. So I train people up to sea level. Um, in communications, I train them in error management, in um, digital transformation, change management. So, you know, everything that takes a little bit of energy, that's when they, that's when they call me. Um, and now I actually am building my own business together with a couple of other people with the same mindset. And uh, it's called the Austrian Leadership Academy. And we help people grow individually, uh, but we also help them grow their business. And I was so scared to do that because, you know, being an entrepreneur, even in Austria, is it's risky, you know. Um, being employed, especially in a big corporate, as I used to be, it's very comfortable in Austria. You know, you have a very good salary, you have, you know, health insurance and you have, you know, your benefits and all of that um, and, and I just said, okay, this year I'm going to take the break uh, that I never dared to take. And I'm going to focus on just what I love doing. And that's what I'm doing now. So, yeah, that's where my passion is at the moment. It's uh, at my academy, at that, my very own academy. That's awesome. And we, so, yeah, you mentioned to me uh, briefly about it, but I want to hear more. But uh, you mentioned as well. So, uh, we record, so I'm, we're recording this now. Oh, what is it? The 2nd of uh, March, but it'll probably not go out for another week. And you said by the time it goes out, that a website will be live. So, we should get some yes. traffic there. Anyone listening, <laughs> go visit the website now. We'll, we'll get, we'll link yeah, it down below. Yeah, follow me on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, follow Nina on LinkedIn and go and check out the website to give her some, uh, some, uh, some clicks there but uh tell me a bit more about it so you said it's a group of friends and you what are you going to be training how is it going to be delivered i assume it's been uh thought through on a on a practical basis with the corona restrictions we have in place it's not uh cramming 30 people into a very small room and uh, <laughs> with, with, no, no, I wish. with no antibiotics no, i wish <laughs> I wish no. Um, so actually, the thing why we aren't live yet is because we have been so busy doing trainings and workshops. Oh, okay. uh, because one of the things that, especially I, but also my colleagues, um, specialize in is virtual leadership, mm -hmm. and of course, that's a skill that is very much sought after. You know, so we have a lot of requests, and uh, I've had a couple of trainings this week already. I have a few coming up in the next few months. Because, uh, you know, the virtual space is different, right? Uh, but people aren't different just because they are in the virtual space. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about how to be more efficient, how to get out of this, you know, Zoom tunnel, how to engage people, how to interact with people, how to bond, you know, yeah. and how to stay healthy and sane. So, um, yeah, basically, you know, the idea that I had uh, when I started doing the trainings is a very simple one. Because uh, when I was, you know, attending corporate trainings, we always had like this person who was doing lectures and then a little bit of group work so that they could have a little bit of a break. And then you basically wind up and then you have, you know, whatever notes you have, right? And I always felt it's a big time investment for me as a manager. And I've been a manager for like 15 years now, you know, so going to a workshop for a day or even half a day means that all the work that I can't do during this time needs to be done either earlier or later on, right? So it's, it's a big time investment. And I always felt um, it's not sustainable to do that because it's an inspiration, but which impact does it really have on me? Which learning curve does it have? And, and I felt I'm going to try to do it differently. So what I did is I work according to a very simple principle. It's called, it's called um, head, heart, hands. Um, head, heart, hands. Yes, exactly. Okay. So it's just that simple. Um, and basically, the head stands for information, right? Um, because I believe that if people want to change or want to grow, they need to know what's going on. You need to give them the facts, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the what, so to say. The heart stands for motivation. Um, and motivation means like, why would I want to do that? 
why would I want to change? Why would I want to learn that? Or why would I want to apply that? What's in it for me? That's the why, right? And, uh, and then the next step is the hands. And the hands, they stand for skills. Because if you've understood what this is about, and then you've developed the motivation to do it, and you don't know how to do it, then you're going to be very frustrated because you're going to fail, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe in this kind of continuity of applying all three principles in, in the trainings that, that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very hands-on. It's very uh, practical in a way. And this is how, how I do it. So that's my approach. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And I think that that feeds really uh, sort of well with my my philosophy around winning and, and how you build a win because part of it is skills development and, and talent development and uh and and you know something that has come up time and time again in the with the people i've talked to is the importance of coaching one way or another whether it's like talking to someone and building a set of goals and objectives or literally coaching people as a swimmer or a, <laughs> or a sports yeah. person or a, or a musician uh the the importance to get those feedback loops and and build on you know build on all those parts understanding what you're doing understanding why you're doing it, what was the motivation and making sure you sustain that motivation. And then, uh, and then, yeah, I, I like that a lot. And then the how with the hands, you know, how are you going to yeah. do it? Execution. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I wanted to sort of talk about was, I guess, I, I think it's really interesting the communication challenges we have in the world right now with uh, instant communication and with the different platforms and all of the right now, uh, as we're recording this, we've just had Donald Trump leaving office and being banned from Twitter, for example, and a lot of people being sort of um, taken off Twitter. And then we've had a, I don't know if you heard about this service called Parler, which was a kind of a, uh, well, it wasn't specifically right wing, but it ended up being a very right wing um, platform that got itself banned. And then like Amazon took it off its cloud services and stuff. It's a very interesting time, especially if you look at it from an American perspective of kind of freedom of speech, like definitely the, the, the freedom of speech has, conversation has been somewhat damaged, I would say by, by those actions. But I think it's really interesting because like, how do we communicate well in this modern day? And I know that you're you're a, a bit of an expert already on this thing called Clubhouse, which has just come out. You've promised me an invite now, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm I'm interested to know your thoughts on that because it's it's a really fast changing landscape. And uh, and I was wondering how you deal with that and how how you sort of uh, factor that into your training and your 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 marketing. Um. So. Basically, what I, what I think is, uh, first of all, if you want to build communication, you need to make sure that you know one thing, and that is your values. Because mm -hmm. it always starts with your values. People keep on thinking about strategy. It's like, okay, what do I want to sell and which channels? And I'm going to go on Facebook. I'm going to do this. No, it also always starts with the values. It always starts with what do you stand for, Right. Um, and then you build a vision and then you build a mission. And that sounds so basic, but it's so hard to do that um, because this is the way how you create an authentic message that is credible, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're not authentic, if you're not credible, your communication is probably going to be very hard to get across no matter how much time and money you invest into it. Um, when it comes to uh, planning a strategy, you know, there is um, channels is the very large part that you plan or that I plan. Uh, because first, as I said, you start with the values, you start with the messages, but you also need to start understanding who you want to talk to and who you want to reach and what these people want to hear. Right. So um, a lot of people, especially when they talk about products, uh, maybe also governments, when they talk about Corona, they communicate what they feel is important. So they will talk, let's say, about figures or they will talk about um, like this is the best, uh, I don't know, um, avocado, let's say avocado in the world, you know, because of this, this and that. And and then the customer says, yeah, but I, I actually don't want uh, to know if this is the best avocado. I just want to know, is it healthy? 
you know I, i'm not so interested in the taste because i have an issue with my i don't know uh, kidneys and you know i don't want to have any bad reactions and then you go like in the communication, everything is targeted towards this is the best avocado, the best tasting avocado, and you know customers aren't interested, right? So, what's the story that you're telling? Mm -hmm. um, what are the emotions that you want to create in a person? And then, uh, you know, the very last bit, uh, if you manage to, you know, build a story that people want to hear, if you manage to engage your audience, because that's what communication really is about. It's about engaging your audience and making them feel emotional. And, uh, and that's what, you know, gets you further. Then you decide, okay, where I'm going to reach these people on which channels. And I think Clubhouse um, is a super interesting channel but we need to see it as what it is. It's not mainstream yet, right? It's targeted mm -hmm. towards a very small bubble, uh, which at the moment is, you know, communication geeks like me that love to try new media. Um, it's a lot of startups. It's a lot of entrepreneurs. It's a lot of uh, C-level people that use it as a PR tool mm -hmm. as part of their strategy. Yes, that's true. But it's not a mainstream medium yet. Neither is Twitter if you actually analyze it quite carefully. It depends a little bit on the market. And yes, Donald Trump used it for political reasons, but for products, let's say Twitter is not very useful. No. It's, you use Twitter for sports and politics, you know? Yeah. That's what you do yeah. on, on Twitter. Um, so you need to be a bit careful with that. I think what's so interesting uh, with Clubhouse is because it gives us something um, in a time where human touch is missing and it gives us human voice yeah it gives us a way of how to connect and you know when you talk to somebody over the phone it's it always feels so different than talking to them on you know signal or telegram or whatsapp or, or anything because written communication just doesn't touch the heart as much as the voice does mm -hmm. and i think this is why clubhouse is getting so big right now because this has this huge opportunity. And of course, it doesn't belong to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, which a lot of people appreciate as well, <laughs> um, especially in the community that you, know, uh, that you find there. But um, it's a nightmare for GDPR. It's a nightmare for data protection. They literally don't really care about any of the existing rules or regulations. And people still sign up for it within a split second. You know, it's a hype. They've done it very well from a marketing perspective. So you can only sign up if you're uh, operating on an iPhone. Uh, simply not because they want to make it more exclusive, but because they haven't uh, done an Android version. So that's, yeah. that's the truth. You know, it's not exclusivity. It's just the lack of technology. Um, and you can only get there if you're invited. So everybody is trying to get an invite and you have two free invites a day. And then you, you think like, oh, which of my friends is super cool? And who will I give my invitations to? And then after a week, you realize, oh, so I had two invitations yesterday. Today I got three. If I give those away, I'll have another three tomorrow. Yeah, um, yeah not that exclusive anymore. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if you remember, um, uh, maybe you're too young, but there was a, a website called A Small World uh, back in the early-ish 2000s, maybe 2010s, but it was similar kind of thing and it was very it was supposed to be very exclusive and you could only be invited in and it was it ended up being a lot of a lot of very wealthy sort of trustafarians i don't know if you know what that means but uh, people who uh, from rich trust you know their daddy's got a trust and then their trustafarian is, is the expression and uh you know they have their yachts down in saint tropez and they share each other's uh you know villas and things but yeah. it, it became very like that. And of course, if you could get in, then you were a part of that that crew. I, I found it fascinating to see because I knew some people who got on it. I never got the an invite myself. Uh, so obviously yeah. I'm bitter and, and you know, <laughs> twisted about it. And so, uh, no, but it, it, is, it is a very interesting thing because the power of that kind of exclusivity as well is very, very powerful in, in marketing, right? Absolutely. And, you know, so this is what you are trying to achieve with, uh, with your merchandise, right? There's not a lot of goods that you want to go um, very mainstream with, um, except for chewing gum, for example. You know, that's, that's super, um, it's not supposed to be very exclusive. But um, they did it in a very smart way. Um, it's not unique, it's not new, but it's very well made, right? Mm. Um, we will see how it develops. They, they have excellent funding. 
Mm. One must say, excellent funding. Uh, so they just did another round. It's very successful. Um, as I said, it fulfills a need and a need that has gotten even stronger now during Corona. It gives us a lot of opportunity for personal branding, which is very smart and, and great. Um, it's super good for networking. Um, and it's, you know, uh, and it breaks down barriers. And I love that about um, kind of uh, the new technologies because um, communication like Facebook, like Instagram, um, social media is breaking down um, barriers of communication. Because for example, like how often have you just randomly met somebody at seed level and started talking to them about, let's say, I don't know, ice hockey or ice cream? Mm. How often has this happened to you? Probably not that often. Not right? very often, no. Not I'm very not, often. I'm right? not even around C suite people that often anyway. <laughs> exactly. Or not knowingly. That, exactly. But that's that's because you know this is how business life in real life works. However, on Clubhouse, uh, you can randomly join them and you can raise your hand and <coughs> pardon me and just chat up to them. And then they might stay in the room longer. And I've had a lot of uh, C-level conversations that continued after the public talk because they were fascinated uh, about what we had discussed or because they just wanted to hang in and explore the media mm. a bit more, right? So in this way, it's breaking down barriers of, of hierarchies. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, and this is what, what social media does, right? Everybody has a voice and everybody has a voice that counts uh, basically the same. I mean, you know, the number of followers, of course, uh, helps. But basically, yeah. so if there's a Facebook post, right, and you and I both comment on it, my voice is just as precious as yours. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's not more precious because somebody works at sea level or somebody's unemployed. It's um, actually the same level. And yes, there's algorithms and, and all of that. But the principle is that every voice counts the same. And I find that very interesting when it comes to communication. It would mm. be beautiful if that was uh, the same way offline as well, wouldn't it? I think it's interesting. Also, just to mention Reddit. I don't know if you, are you, uh, do you yeah. go on to Reddit much? I, I'm, I've become, that's my go-to now as social media. I don't, I don't really look at Instagram very often. I don't look at Facebook barely ever. Uh, but Reddit, I, I find very interesting because you can really focus on what you're interested in and the people upvote the most interesting slash relevant slash, you know, in, interesting um, uh, comments or, or, or points. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's a really, in, it's, there's something there that I think is going to change some behaviors possibly um, because it's different from what you've just said in Facebook, for example, Facebook is, even though it's, everyone in the world has it it's rare that you're going to be on a public comment feed you know seeing something and, and actually as you said my comment has as much weight as your comment so if i say something extremely you know uh, interesting or, or or topical or you say something you know our comments are going to be way down amongst everyone else's and not really that relevant um so i think i think it's it, there is there it is it's kind of interesting how all of that's going to change. And I see the way in which people are fighting back against these algorithms, like you mentioned, you know, this sort of fight back against Facebook and what WhatsApp and, you know, move people moving to signal and stuff. It's very interesting times. And it's uh, obviously time to be dynamic and, uh, and get some help if you need it. So uh, you should hire some, uh, some experts in that stuff. <clears throat> Hashtag get in touch with Nina. <laughs> um so listen nina i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up there uh, i think it's been really really interesting and uh, lovely to talk to you and great to catch up after all this time um thank you so much and thanks so much for bringing your energy as well and your passion it it's it, it's just as clear to me as, as when i met you back in the <laughs> f so uh i think uh you you keep you keep it going because it's there's something special about that um, and I really wish you the very best of luck with the Austrian Leadership Academy. Uh, I shall link the website below or wherever it's going to be on. I, I still don't really understand how all that works on, on the podcast thing, but uh, I'm sure you can Google lead Austrian Leadership Academy uh, and, and ah. find it as well. So uh, if not, Google Nina and um, you know, they, you definitely have your name there and uh, and find her on LinkedIn and link up with her uh, and make sure you hire her and you go and click on her website and you go and support her because she's Perfect. awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Nick. This has been so much fun. Thank you for um, this super interesting conversation. There's like so many more things that I could talk to you about. Like I feel like this could go on all night, you know, without even having a bottle of wine next to the computer. Yeah. We, um, we definitely need wine next time. I've, re I've realized podcasts actually can work <laughs> with wine in hand as well. I have a cup. I had a cup of tea during this one. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. We've grown up. Nick. We've grown up. <laughs> um but yeah no it was uh, absolutely great thank you so much for this all right you take care nina stay safe you too. bye bye